Welcome to Clothesline Theater. We have been waiting for you to tune in to hear tales of Prince Edward Island, a place of history and some mystery. You may be surprised by the true stories that have been unearthed and brought to life by our radio dramas. We invite you to settle into a comfortable chair and let the voices and sounds trigger your imagination as you hear the following dramatic story. When Britain declared war on Germany on August 4, 1914, the United States of America assumed a position of neutrality and isolation, wanting to continue trade and business with both sides of the conflict. However, as the war dragged on, circumstances led to the declaration of war on Germany by the United States Congress in April of 1917. As American soldiers prepared for the conflict, so too did American medical teams, which were drawn from hospitals across the country. Approximately 60 Prince Edward Island women who were working in the nursing field in the United States found themselves enlisting or being called up for duty. One of those nurses was Beatrice MacDonald, who had grown up in North Bedeck as the daughter of farmer and politician Honorable Daniel MacDonald. After attending school on the island, she graduated as a nurse from the New York City Training School for Nurses in 1905. When war broke out, she was working as a surgical nurse and office manager for Dr. George Brewer in the city. Good morning, Dr. Brewer. I hope you had a restful night after yesterday's heavy operating load. You will find the day's schedule of patients on your desk. Thank you, Nurse McDonald. It seems no matter how early I arrive at the office, you're ahead of me. Before we begin today's work, I must tell you that with the United States now part of the war in Europe, I have volunteered to return to France as commander of the 1st Presbyterian Unit. The assignment is for me to take over British Hospital No. 1 at Etretat. Dr. Brewer had volunteered to go to France for the second time during the war. His previous experience there had been in 1915, when he had led a private surgical team for three months in the village of Julie. Nurse MacDonald had been one of the U.S. medical personnel who had accompanied him. I expected as much, Dr. Brewer. Of course, you can count on me to be part of the team. That was the response I was hoping for, Nurse MacDonald. Oh, and that will be Major Brewer now. By July of 1917, the British were preparing for the Third Battle of Ypres. They requested the Americans at Atratat to provide two medical teams for a British casualty clearing station, and Dr. Brewer's team was one of them. Now that we've arrived in France, we have been ordered to prepare for our new duty by reporting to the gas school at Le Havre. There we will learn to identify different deadly gases. How many gases are there? That's what we're going to find out. Oh, Nurse McDonald, this building makes me feel jittery. Now don't worry. Just stay calm and pay attention to what the officer tells us. Good morning, nurses. Thank you for reporting to our facility. When you enter the gas chamber, you will be exposed briefly to several different gases that will be identified and explained. As well, part of the exercise is to teach you to adjust your gas mask within 10 seconds. Major Brewer's medical team was dispatched after two anxious days of waiting and arrived somewhere in Belgium, just four miles from the front line. The hospital was under canvas, except for the large operating theater consisting of seven tables housed in corrugated iron Nissan huts. There was also a smaller, two-table operating theater under canvas. Casualties were handled in two hospital sections with nine wards on each side. Duckboard paths were laid to keep people above the mud as they went about their business. Thank goodness my shift is finished. I'm dead on my feet and plan to go find my bed for a few hours rest. You've earned it, Sister McDonald. I hope you can sleep and dream about something good. Oh, watch out! Good grief. I'm sorry, nurse. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jostle you. Save the story for later. She's face down in the mud and sinking. Help get her up. Oh, Sister McDonald, are you all right? Oh, dear, you're covered in mud. Now you'll have to get cleaned up before you can go rest. I'll be fine. You go back to your work and I'll manage. If I can stay on my feet. Though the hospital was so close to the front, 
Nurse McDonald felt secure in that the roofs of the tents were painted with large red crosses to signify that they were a hospital. On July 30th, 1917, Nurse McDonald realized the great Allied offensive of the Third Battle of Ypres, otherwise known as Passchendaele, had started. As she tried to sleep in the tent she shared with four British nurses, all hell seemed to break loose. She sat on her cot, watching the flashes of the guns in the sky and listening to the explosions and whizzing of shells. Put some cotton in your ears, dear, and get some sleep, Sister McDonald. We have a lot of heavy days ahead yet. Well, I'll try. The battle raged on, and during the first 24 hours, 2,400 casualties were brought to the three hospitals in the area. Operating teams worked continuously for 22 hours, then rested four, and then worked another 18 hours straight. Move him out, sterilize the table, and get the next boy on. That's all they are, Dr. Brewer. Just boys. I know. It's very hard to deal with these heart-rending casualties, but we must carry on and try to save some lives. Life at British Casualty Clearing Station No. 61 consisted of intense stressful work and little rest. Then came the fateful night when the painted red crosses failed to protect the hospital. MacDonald and her tentmates lay in bed when they heard airplanes, and then three large explosions. I don't believe this! Those planes are dropping bombs! Quickly, girls, get your steel helmets! I believe they are out to get us! Oh my God, what should we do? Our tent is riddled with fragments of bomb and debris. I've been hit by something. There's blood trickling down my cheeks. Dear God, I can't see out of my right eye. Help me, please. Someone get on the other side of her for support and help me get her over to the hospital. We need to move fast in case another plane's on the way. Sister McDonald, we're at the hospital and Dr. Brewer is right here. We need to get you up on the examining table. My eye! My eye! The pain that's in my eye! I'm here, Nurse McDonald. Try to lie still so I can examine your face. I'll give you something for the pain. Nurse, are the other injured nurses being tended? Yes, sir. All right, now. The pain medication will start to take effect. Just be calm and listen as I tell you what you need to know. You took shrapnel to both cheeks and your right eye. I will be able to remove the pieces from your cheeks, but I can't take the shrapnel from your eye. You will have to be transferred by hospital train to Boulogne-sur-Mer for treatment by the eye specialist, Dr. Lister. I'll bandage your eye for the trip. All right, Dr. Brewer. I trust you. Doctor, there are other nurses that will have to be sent as well. We'll do the best we can for all of them. Nurse Beatrice MacDonald, a member of the American Army Nursing Corps, was to be the first seriously injured American in World War I. Major Brewer, the train is ready to be loaded, sir. Thank you, soldier. As her commanding officer, I will accompany Nurse MacDonald and the others in order to watch over them. Nurse, have you made sure the wounded have had enough morphine to make the trip? As much as I can give right now, you'll have to take more with you. I'm a tough islander, Dr. Brewer. We'll make it. What's happening? Why is the train stopping? Nurse McDonald, there's going to be a delay. We have been stopped outside Hasbrook because the village is being bombed. We will have to wait. Try to rest. Could I have a little morphine? The train waited for three hours before the signal was given that it was safe to proceed. After a long, painful night, Nurse McDonald was finally admitted to a nurse's hospital, and Dr. Lister, with the aid of a magnet, tried to remove the deeply embedded shell fragment. Dr. Brewer, thanks for assisting me. Let's get on with this. I'm afraid the shrapnel can't be removed from her eye. The only solution is to remove the eye itself. I suggest we transfer to the officer's hospital and operate there. She'll get better food and accommodations. I agree with your recommendation, Dr. Lister. Let's get it done as soon as possible. They're ready to put you under anesthetic now, Nurse McDonald. You realize this means you can go home to the States. I have only just begun to do my bit here. Dr. Brewer, don't let them send me home or to England. 
Colonel Lister told me I will be well in six weeks and can go back to work. I want to go back to Etretat as soon as I can be moved. If that's what you want, I promise I will help you. Major Brewer kept his promise, and after a period of convalescence, Nurse Beatrice MacDonald returned to her unit, where she remained until she was transferred as Chief Nurse to No. 2 American Expeditionary Force at Baccarat in May of 1918. The hospital unit entrained for Germany and became part of the Army of Occupation in December 1918. Two days before Christmas, she received orders to return to the United States. She eventually received the American decorations of Distinguished Service Cross, Distinguished Service Medal, and the Purple Heart. She was also awarded the British Military Medal, the Associate of the Royal Red Cross, and the French Croix de Guerre. These military honors made Beatrice MacDonald, who grew up in North Bedeck, PEI, the most decorated nurse of World War I. <laughs> nurse Beatrice MacDonald, Wounded in War. Presented by Wide Heritage Properties Incorporated. Narrator, Stuart Smith. Nurse MacDonald, Catherine Dixon. Dr. Brewer, Jim Dixon. Nurse 1, Patty Arsenault. Officer, Roger Ahern. Nurse 2, Sarah McIntyre. Soldier, Mark Phillips. Nurse 3, Michelle Askew. Private, Mitchell Fraser. Dr. Lister, Stephen Hurst. Introduction, Lowell Hustis. Musician, Christine Anderson Gallant. Foley's, Alexandra Gallant, Krista Bryson, Nathan Wiley. Recording engineer, Peter Gallant. Scripts, written by Marlene Campbell. Based on research by Catherine Dewar for her book titled, Those Splendid Girls, Prince Edward Island Nurses in the Great War. Any errors in historical accuracy in the composition of the script are the responsibility of Wyatt Heritage Properties. This project has been supported by the Building Communities Through Arts and Heritage Program of the Department of Canadian Heritage.